We good? We're good. Okay. Well, let me get up on the high chair. I can stand for a little bit, but not for very long, and certainly not for a whole hour. Uh, those of you that were in Salt Lake last year, remember that I sat up there right next to the lectern the whole time on two little chairs, and it worked very good. This looks so much better. This is going to work so much better. All right, there we go. Wow. John, I get the I get the hangover slot, but look, I got a full room almost. I I appreciate you being here. I really do. I'm Ruth Bavisset. Uh, I work for CPanel. Now, just as we kind of get started, how many of you have never used Pearl Critic? Don't know what it is? Are curious about it? Okay, good. A couple of hands. That's good. Those of you that had your hands up just now, how many of you have been programming Pearl for six months or less? A year or less. Okay, good. That's kind of what I expected. So most of you know what I'm talking about when I say Pearl Critic. And you probably, many of you, have some firm opinions about it. All right, let's do a little introduction first. I've been using Pearl professionally since about 2001. I was working on a, a Solaris box that had a, a library automation system on it. And the API was all uh, Perl accessible. And so I was using Perl for that. And so that's when I picked up Perl, and I really enjoyed working with it. And so that's when I kind of got my start. And three years ago, I went to cPanel and started working there. I am by no means any sort of an expert, and I do not attempt to imitate one. I'm a poor actor and a worse liar, so I do not even attempt to impersonate an expert in anything. However, I, like many of you, have some firm opinions about Pearl Critic. And I'm a little bit of a detail nut. Um, I worked in libraries for most of 20 years. Um, I've long held that librarianship is a great place to put obsessive compulsive disorder to work. Um, catalogers. Um, and so I, I kind of get their mindset. I understand where they're coming from. And I appreciate that a lot. Okay, so why, why am I here besides the fact that, you know, Gene Hack scheduled me for this slot? Well, I enjoy doing this kind of thing. I really do. And I'll, I'll whine and kvetch about it, and afterwards I'll complain about how terrible it went, but I really do enjoy doing this kind of thing, and, and I keep getting told I'm pretty good at it. I don't actually believe them. Um, I get that for some people, this is kind of a contentious topic. Uh, I've learned at cPanel in my time there that all you have to do to start a flame war on the dev list is say the word, Pearl Critic. And, and immediate flames erupt and, you know, the fire extinguishers go off in the building and howling and carrying on both ways. But Pearl Critic is really not any big deal to me. And I'll explain why, and hopefully it'll be no big pain to you either at the end of our time together. Now, because it is kind of a contentious little topic, I'm going to set some rules. I know I shouldn't have to, but yeah. Um, do I really need to say this in the 21st century at a professional conference? Is it an indictment of the community that I feel like I need to? Thank you. Um, we have some people who have been at this so long that they are certain they can no longer be wrong. I have bumped into some of these in my professional career with Pearl. Realize I've been doing Pearl for 15 years. When I started doing Pearl, this person sitting right down here was eight, my daughter. So, and, and she's now a member of this professional community. So, you know, I've been doing this a long time and I'm not immune to wrongness. Um, there is a time I'm gonna hold some time for questions and comments and discussion and I, I look forward to some lively ones we've got a timekeeper down here to keep us on track but I, I think we'll do fine there is however no time planned for attacking each other personally or vitriol of any sort um, and you will be ejected from the room if that happens uh, I'm a member of the standards of conduct committee I can make it stick trust me okay so it kind of started with this book right it, 
pro-critic and pro-best practices tend to be kind of immutably connected to each other in people's heads. And, and you know, Damien Conway writes this book and says, here's a set of best practices. These are good ideas. How many of you have actually read the first chapter of the book? But how many of you have read the rest without reading the first chapter? Uh-huh. Guilty. Caught you. All right. The first chapter actually tells you this is not a Bible. It tells you this is a group of suggestions, things that people have found that make their code more readable, more maintainable, and so they're good ideas. Pick and choose and take the ones you want, the ones that make sense for you, your coding style, and your project, and use them. We'll talk about why that's a problematic thing here shortly. So, why use it? Quote from the book. Most all of us can quote this pretty much, right? Okay, a corollary to this, you know, maintain the code, write the code as if the guy who's going to maintain it is a murderous psychopath who knows where you live. The corollary to this is that every project has two coders. You and you six months from now. That murderous psychopath six months from now knows where you live. <laughs> right? So, yeah, write your code as if your life depends on good code, maintainable code, because you irritate that person, and who knows what will happen. And, and there's always more than one way to do things. You know, Tim Toady is, is the mantra of this community, but yet, if you're working in a team on a large project, and you've got 20 or 30 or 100 developers working on something, it's kind of a good idea to be doing some things more or less consistently. It makes sense if a more junior person is going to have to be maintaining the code of a more senior individual, that that code is readable to them, is understandable to them. So I'm not saying write to the lowest common denominator. I'm saying write consistently, define what your consistency is and go with it. And that's what we're gonna cover how to do here in ProCritic. Now, for those of you that have never touched ProCritic before, let's talk about ProCritic itself. The rest of you, please be patient just a moment. All right. It is a script and a related set of Perl libraries, and it has a bunch of rules programmed into it. And you can define which rules are enforced and how hard they're enforced and how they're implemented, and you can even implement new rules. This thing's loose. That's better. You can define your own rules. You can define groups of rules that are important to you. You can all kinds of configuration for this thing, but it defines a set of rules. It does not, it does not edit your code. It doesn't make you write code in any specific way. It is a tool for seeing if your code is consistent with that set of rules. Whether or not you have to be in compliance with that is a matter of policy not a matter of Perl Critic. Now at cPanel, we have a Perl Critic profile, and it dates back, oh, longer than me, and before a piece of code is committed to master, it must pass that. And if it doesn't, the release team will kick it back at you. It doesn't pass Perl Critic. And if we change the rules, we don't have to go in and retroactively modify millions of lines of code. No, we just, as you touch that file, Every time a file is touched, it must adhere to the Perl Critic profile at that time. And that's policy, not code. It in no way dictates how you code. You can define your own sets of rules, but Perl best practices stuff comes installed. There's a whole raft of things that are defined by Perl best practices, and that's why the book and the program kind of get tied together in people's minds because there's a whole bunch of PBP rules built into Perl Critic. It's got a bunch of command line options. These are the kinds of things you use. You can say how tough you want to be. And when I first bumped into it, it was 54321. The default is five. If you just say Perl Critic in a file name, it's going to run gently. But you can be as, as evil as you want to be against your code. And there's a whole bunch of other things. You can, you can tell it, only use this one rule. Use a different profile. Use a different theme. You can define specific rules for just this run. There's all kinds of things you can do with this. These are the common stuff. 
Now, m most of the time, you're going to say Perl critic dash dash some level and a file name. I wrote a little module. This module flunks Perl critic badly. This is default installed Perl critic, no special themes, no special stuff. But there's a whole bunch of problems here. Okay. Anybody see something specific they want to point out? Our pump king, Sawyer. You're not unpacking add underscore. Thank you. That's in the first subroutine there. Right. Thank you. Yes. There was a hand back here. Thank you. Galen. Null string isn't used. Null string. Somebody got me. Uh, no Thank you. That was called without return. All right, good. So y'all are seeing some of this. Now, are you, are you realizing that because you've been bit by that by ProCritic before? Yes. No, okay, thought so. That's all right, because you've been bitten by somebody's ProCritic profile. That's fine. So let's see what ProCritic Brutal says about this. The code is not tidy. Inconsistent indentation. Thank you. Um, that's a severity one item. You have to go to Brutal to get that. You can also get that separately by running Perl tidy, but that's the subject of somebody else's conversation, not mine. Um, no package scope version. Sawyer, I'm surprised at you. I know, I'm sorry. Uh, you let me down. If you're going to release this to CPAN, it's got to have a package scope dollar version, or else it will get thrown back at you hard. So, you know, now that for something as trivial as this, probably not necessary. But for any package you're actually going to release, it's a good idea. Always unpack add under. In the first one, we directly referenced one of the parameters rather than unpacking it into its own variable using shift or add under. And Pro Best Practices doesn't care if you use shift or if you use an array add under. Either way will satisfy the rule, okay, which I did in the second one. Subroutine fuss about some stuff does not end with return. Thank you. Why is it important to do that? Just a second. New folks who have been programming Perl a short time, what is the return from fuss about from stuff? Thank you. The value of dollar A. Lindsay, you haven't been coding for very long. Did you figure that out? Did you know that? Hey, it's the last operation that happened, but it's kind of, yeah, yeah. Being explicit in your returns makes it clearer and costs you nothing. That's one that I harp on like crazy, and we have thousands of such bugaboos in our code, and it makes me cry every time I see one, and every time I find one, I fix it. Okay, but there was plenty more. <laughs> Use strict and use warning aren't there. Um, I used a static number, 3.14, in my assignment for $A and fuss about some stuff. Um, Pearl Critic doesn't like that. 0, 1, and 2 are allowed, but anything else, assign it to a variable. If you uppercase the full name of it by convention, that means it's probably used as a constant, although it doesn't have to be. But if you use read only or you use const, then you can assign these static things to use as constants. And then if you need to change it later, um, like if you wanted to increase the precision of this by some digits, you change it one place and then everywhere it's used, it's changed. Uh, quotes with an empty string, no non-white space characters in the quote, null string. There are other ways to do that that are slightly less easy to look over. Um, and postfix control S, unless. Um, using unless at all is suggested in PVP, but it is not a Perl critic rule. Um, you can use unless. However, post fixing your, your control statements is handled in Perl critic. Um, myself, I don't mind an unless that's post fixed, unless you're saying unless not. <laughs> it's too early in the morning, and I have not had enough caffeine for unless not. All right, so, yeah. Or a very complicated statement. And a postfix unless with a really complicated statement, yeah, no. If you're just doing something simple like I did here, then that's kind of okay. I, I can, I, I will 
bite my lip and deal with that one. But a postfix if can mislead someone about program flow. Because they're going to go ahead and do the thing and then go, if, oh, shoot, I wasn't supposed to do that. Right? Sawyer's laughing. That means he's done that, right? I agree. Yeah. <laughs> you've, you, you've done that. You go and you walk through a whole subroutine. You get back and you go, crap, I didn't need to do that. Yeah. So post fix. Well, okay. So how do you fix these things? Well, you edit your code for one thing. <laughs> Don't do that. Or you can modify your ProCritic RC so that ProCritic doesn't care about those things anymore. Wait, what? New folks. What is the ProCritic RC? It is a file where you can configure the behavior of ProCritic. All right, in the first stanza here, I've decided that using warnings is much more important than dash four. I want it to show up regardless of what level I've set. So I've set the severity on that for five. That fires on gentle rather than on stern. So you can change the priority of a rule. How severe a problem is this? You can change that. In the second stanza, there, the prohibit fosfix controls has a parameter for what things you want to allow or disallow. You can say, you know, a postfix and less, don't complain about that. Which is what I've said here. And in the, the third one, that require a constant dollar version thing that, that Sawyer didn't catch, um, I just think that's a silly rule for what I'm doing in this project. So I'm just going to disable that completely. So I do this dash thing in the rule name. Your ProCritic RC lets you configure the behavior of ProCritic to a very fine level. You can do all kinds of crazy things. And individual rules may have parameters you can set. And you can Perl dock the rule, generally, and, and find what things you can set. But you can always set severity, and you can always disable or enable a rule for every rule. I make it sound so easy, don't I? I make it sound so straightforward and obvious and good, don't I? Well, that's because I think it is. So why all of this carrying on? And why is it that all you have to do is mention that word to get a flame war? Well, there's the thing. Newer coders see pro best practices and they go, ooh, this is the way to write good code. And they start following it religiously. And they go, oh, Pearl Critic is a great way to enforce those things. I can check. I don't have to manually reread the book on every piece of code. Cool. And they use Pearl Critic without any modifications and without a Pearl Critic RC. And so they enforce this as holy writ upon their code. Well, it's a common embryonic behavior. I did it for a while, too. Okay? It, it's okay. Just know those people are newer coders and be kind to them because we want them to stick around and eventually, you know, get past that. Don't be tacky and rude to them. It's not helpful. Okay? More experienced coders find that very annoying because they know that Tim Toady. They know that ProCritic is not always right. They know that ProCritic has some rules in it that might not make sense for a specific project. And they have their own style and they're rather attached to it. So I was noodling around trying to figure out how do we reframe this problem? How do we reframe the question in a way that is more useful? And in the Perl doc for Perl Critic, I came up with this. This is quoted from the Perl doc. Coding standards are deeply personal and highly subjective. The goal of ProCritic is to help you write code that conforms with a set of best practices. Our primary goal is not to dictate what those practices are, but to implement the practices discovered by others. Ultimately, you make the rules. ProCritic is merely a tool for encouraging that consistency. Remember I said it doesn't edit your code? It still doesn't. It's merely a tool for encouraging consistent behavior when you're coding. So let's reframe the problem. Newer coders conflate a set of best practices with the set of best practices. Sound fair? They see this set of best practices and the set that is embodied in ProCritic and they say that's the right way to write code. <clears throat> More experienced coders forget that no one's actually going to force them to conform to that set as the set outside of the bounds of a project. Best practices, best practices. Sounds like a buzzword bingo thing, doesn't it? 
well, what are best practices? What is the best Perl practices? God, if we ask, okay, how many of you have been coding Perl for 10 years or more? Okay. If we ask all of you folks, what is your best practice? We might get 15 or 20 different answers, you think? And that's okay, because Tim Toady, right? So they said it. Deeply personal, highly subjective. Subjective. You know, the coding practices for cPanel and the coding practices for the Koha project, which I have committed to for years, are completely different. They use a completely different ProCritic RC. Koha, as far as I know, still doesn't use one at all. But you don't see ternary ifs in Koha very often. Why is that? Well, nobody's picked that up. If you happen to look at the cPanel code, you see them all over. They're just everywhere. You see postfix and lesses in cPanel's code all the time. You see postfix ifs occasionally, and I just cringe. But you don't see those kinds of things in Koha nearly so often. Why is that? Well, the Koha project deals with a lot of coders who are not as experienced. And so as a community, they have kind of gone to a slightly lower level of, of code brilliance and code cleverness in order to enable those newer coders to be able to participate. cPanel only hires people who are pretty darn good at it already, and so they expect a little higher standard of, of elegance in their code. Highly subjective. It could be as short as, does it run? You don't use ProCritic at all. Does it work? Yep, good enough. <laughs> Julian, you laugh. <laughs> uh huh. <laughs> How many of us have written a module where that's the standard we put it to? Does it work? Yep, done, release it. How many of those do you have on CPAN? <laughs> Sawyer? <laughs> I don't, I, sorry, I'm not deliberately picking on you, but you are an easy target. And we love you, Sawyer. I'm not going to bag on Sawyer. Mwah. Yes. It could be as simple as does it run, or it could be as complex as you like. How much time are you willing to spend on that? Well, you know, how big a deal is it? Do you expect to be running this same piece of code 15 years from now after it's been maintained by hundreds of people? Yeah, then you probably need a little tighter set of rules on what it looks like because you're going to have people who haven't even been born yet hacking on this code. Right? I mean, the first version of cPanel was written by a teenager who's still our most prolific developer. Mm hmm. Some of his code, you can tell, was written by a teenager. It might involve efficiency hacks. If you found something that is particularly efficient, you might write a, a Perl critic module, a Perl critic rule that enforces that efficient behavior over something less efficient. You can totally do that. And in fact, I think there's a few rules that do that. Already built right in. If you use Perl critic at all, remember, it's a tool for encouraging consistency. It is not the policy that deems that you must use it. That's a separate negotiation. So, you're working on a project at work. You're working on a big project in the open source space. How are you going to use it? You want to do it because of uh, reasons, and you, you think consistency is a good idea, and you've bought what I've said for the last 25 minutes, and you, you think that that's okay, that we need to, to be consistent. So how are you going to go about it without causing flame wars? Well, I've got a secret for you. You're not. There's going to be some, but the first step is to make sure that everybody on the team actually understands the problem. Hey, you know, conveniently, the committee is going to put this video on afterwards. Maybe you can sell them with my presentation as effectively as you've been sold on it, right? Try that. They need to understand what the purpose is. It's not to enforce a set of laws and rules and regulations and a Bible and let's Bible thump, right? It's not like that. It's about consistency and it's about so the person who's seeing your code five years, ten years from now can maintain it without losing their marbles. Once you can kind of get that in their head, then you say, let's customize this, make it do the things that we think are important to give us better advice on how to do our code. So you start with the existing Pearl Critic modules. 
and it's not hard to get a list of them. Procritic-L will give you a list of all rules that are currently installed. And create a consensus Procritic-RC, which might be configuring some of them and changing the severity, or it might be removing rules completely, or whatever makes sense. Do that with your team. This is easier when your team is small. If your team is like booking.com and you have a thousand developers, this process could be a little painful. It's, it's reached a point at cPanel because we have you know, 50 or 60 people hacking on this thing that changes to Procritic RC happen very slowly. It's easier to do this early in the life cycle of a project, if you can. And then changes then become incremental and it's, it's a lot easier you know, to say, you know, I think we need to remove the rule about using warnings. We don't care if we have warning safe code or not. Um, so can we change that one thing? That becomes much more easy to do, although why you'd do that one is quite beyond me. Okay. Create new modules. Now, I told you in the abstract I was going to talk to you a little about how to do that. So let's do that. This is a good time to do it. Creating new modules is not very hard. You have to define a few variables, the description statements, and when it applies, and how it applies, what sorts of tokens it applies to. And then you write a subroutine called violates. And that's where the action is. That's where you define what violates your rule. And you can tell, OK, I'm looking at words. So I'm looking at tokens. and if the token is currently not grep, then skip on. We don't violate anything. If it's grep, then what comes after grep is important. And if you grep a block, well, that's not allowed. Or whatever you've decided among yourselves as a team is cool or not cool. There's not a rule in Perl Critic for don't use ternary if. But it would be trivially easy to write one if a project wanted to not use that particular idiom because of complexity or whatever, right? So you can create new modules, and all you got to do is, is a handful of variables that are, are well known, and then define, if you want to have parameters that you can feed into it, that's not hard either, there's a setting for that, and then you define the violate subroutine, and that's it. Install it, and Procritic will see it, and you're good to go, okay? So create new modules, whatever your team has decided is important. Do that after you've done this previous step. Go through all the existing modules and say, is this important? Nope, toss it. If this is important, yeah, but let's configure it. Is this important? Yeah, let's take it. Get that all the way done and then say, hey, is there anything else that you think is a really bad idea or is a really good idea that we want to enforce? That's going to take possibly longer. I mean, and then you need to implement it and then you need to test it. Please test your code. Please write test, unit test, plus plus. And make sure that it actually works. How do you do that? Write code that should break it. <laughs> Run it. Include that in your test package. And then commit it. And then put policy in place to enforce it. Does your release manager always run Perl Critic on your code before they commit it? That's, that's where policy comes in. All right, when I was working with Bywater Solutions before I had my current gig, um, when I started that job, I was the sixth employee of the company, and I took over as the migrations person. And so I was leading all migrations, and they really didn't have a coherent system for doing migrations. There's a whole bunch of different library automation systems on the market, and converting from this one to the one we were using and supporting, which is Koha, it was a little different every time. But the overall process was pretty consistent. You're going to need to extract data from the current system, and you need some formatted information about the bibliographic records and the patrons and the items and the current checkouts and all that stuff. And then you can import it into Koha. And so I started writing these scripts to do those extracts and output the data in a fairly standard way, which then Koha could eat. So in time, I had this huge repository of all these scripts, and some of them were deeply custom, and some of them had lots of command line switches you could use to tweak their behavior. That repository is still out. I have it on my GitHub account, and it's messy as heck. I need to get in there one of these days and curate it. But it's, it was just this pile of scripts that I wrote. Well, after I'd been at it about, I don't know, a year and a half, we got a second migrations person. So I had this bundle of code in a big bucket that I 
put out there on our Git, our Git repo so that she could see it. And she started looking over the code and went, wow, this is amazing. And I'm like, yeah, well, you're going to write more one, so you're going to put it in there. So as the head of migrations at that time, I imposed the rule that it needed to pass Pearl Critic 4. It needed to pass Stern Pearl Critic as installed. 3 was nice. We didn't get to the process of doing a custom Pearl Critic RC for that repository because our customers never ever saw it. And generally once the script was written, you didn't need to change it much, if ever. So we could be a little sloppy about it. And it was just the two of us anyway, and she and I shared a brain for more than a year. So it was really a kind of a lax process. But we went through a version of this process. And Pearl Critic-4 gave you pretty good readability that somebody that had good sense could read the code and do things with it if they needed to. You may find that you don't need to customize your Pearl Critic RC much. If you have a small project, two or three devs, talk about it and say, Pearl Critic 4, Pearl Critic 5 is plenty. If you can match that, we're good. So it could be that enforcing that rules lawyering as installed works for you. But that's up to you and your team. Highly subjective, right? Deeply personal. So once you commit it, then put policies in place to enforce it. All right, we have almost 20 minutes left. Not complaining. So let's talk about ProCritic. Questions, comments, thoughts? Julian. That uh, ProCritic RC, can you put that for each project have a separate one? Yeah. So you put it at the root of the repo or Yeah, you can put it in the root of the repo, and then you can, you, you know, in your bash profile, you can set up aliases that use that theme or use that ProCritic RC, whatever you need to do, yeah. Does that command line argument to supply a specific Yep, it does. You can, uh, there's a theme, you can define multiple themes even within the same ProCritic RC. So you could define a theme that says, this is for my deep internal code and this is for my user layer stuff. Or this is for my database code or this is for my UI code. You can define themes within the same ProCritic RC, and then you just say ProCritic dash dash theme whatever and trigger your Perl Critic RC, and you're done. Now, this wouldn't probably be terribly abused, but is there a lexically scoped no Perl Critic? Like you can use no warnings or turn off script for a short? Oh, you are so clever. Thank you. Sometimes you gotta break the rules. Sometimes you, the rule just doesn't make sense and you got to break the rules. Inside your code, you can do hashtag, hashtag, no critic, and name a rule, and that rule will not be enforced on that line. Now, if you do it against the left margin, it will not be in, enforced in that lexical scope. So it is lexically scoped. If you're against the left, line, left edge, it'll be for that entire lexical scope. So it could be package wide or it could be subroutine wide or whatever you need. Or you can do it line by line. Now, if you just say no critic, then no Perl critic rule is enforced on that line. And there's actually a Perl critic rule about not doing that. <laughs> <laughs> unscoped Perl critic, unscoped no critic. It will complain about unscoped no critics. Don't, it really doesn't think you ought to turn the whole thing off. It will fuss about that very thing. Um, there's also a rule for meaningless no critic. If you're doing something and saying no critic for this and that's not the rule that applies, there's actually a pro critic rule that will pick that off and say, you're saying no critic here, but that doesn't make sense. Useless no critic is a valid rule. Okay, so yes, you absolutely can break the rules, but everybody who comes behind you will know <laughs> that you have broken the rules. Edwin. Does that extend to also changing a rule, or do you want a different rule enforced? What you can do there is create a copy of the rule set. The, you, you can't overload, well, you know, you maybe could you could maybe overload the violates function 
I think that would be non-trivial. It might be easier to make a copy and enforce that one instead. It, it doesn't. It doesn't sound terribly user-friendly. It it could confuse users of Procritic that come behind you because you've overloaded part of a module. But you could, you know, create a different module. Say, don't enforce this regular rule. Enforce my changed copy of the rule instead. So yeah, you could do that. Anybody else? Y'all are thinking, hey, you know, she's going to let us out of here when we get more coffee. Galen. A number of, of projects, Procritic RCs, are uh, publicly available in open source. Um, I, I did some Googling around and I found a few that were, that were out there where they've said, you know, for this project, here's our Procritic RC. And you can certainly use those as starting points. Um, deeply subjective still applies. Now, you might try to find projects similar to your own project, or you might find, you know, projects in the same uh, problem domain space. Um, for that kind of activity. Um, just if you don't want to start from the whole big set of stuff that's installed. Um, Damien actually publishes his Procritic RC. It's available online. Is there any bit of script integration with Procritic RC? You know, I don't know. Does anybody else know? Yeah, you can set up syntactic rules for, for them <laughs> to holler at you. John? There's also Emacs support. You can get color highlighting for appropriate violations in real time. Thank you. Yeah, back here. Even without installing any plugins in, um, you just highlight the lines and then do bang for all critic. Um, then we'll pass just those lines through. That's clever. I am so going to do that. <laughs> I've never done that. That is that, I, That's genius. Yeah. Now, tidy. That's neat. I like that. Does it? Yeah. What kind of rules have you written? Um, I haven't written any new rules. Um, cPanel has, oh, I don't know, probably twenty or thirty rules that we've written internally um, for our specific needs that are enhancements of others in many cases. Um, I think some of our rules about uh, no critic behavior are cPanel specific. I have not written any of them. Uh, I spent some time looking it over last night and, and kind of sketched out a draft one just to play with it, but it was, it was a meaningless rule. Back here. Is there any circumstance where you wouldn't want to have explicit returns from a subroutine? Yeah, let's talk about a specific rule. And, and over here, I saw it. Just we'll come back to you in just a moment. Okay, haven't lost you. Okay, bring it. <laughs> All right. Right, by writing your violates function specifically for that behavior. And so, I, oh, go ahead. Just to follow up on the, on the custom rule thing, um, one of the things we use a lot, you can actually use it to enforce coding standards outside of Perl syntax. So, for example, if you have deprecated functions you want people to stop using, you can write a Perl for the rule that loops for use of those and tells it, hey, use this instead. So, if you use something like PBIC and you're doing, you know, 
setting up a search query, and then later on in some string of uh, calls, you're doing a, a single method call. We have a rule that says, hey, you should have put rows equals one back in your, in your search registry because you're just going to call single anyway. Mm -hmm. so, Sure. We actually have one at, at cPanel that um, watches for use of Acme. <laughs> and it will, it will complain if you use anything in Acme. And, and I, did, I was completely unaware of this rule until my teammate triggered it. <laughs> and I walked around the corner to his office and I said, Rikus, why are you using Acme crap here? And the people who laughed know what Acme crap does. <laughs> and he went, oh, just, you know, okay. There's two ways to do that. I'm like, that's clever, but no. And there was another time he did one of them that it's, it's a syntactic sugar kind of Acme module. And, he, and, and I went, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll no critic that. <laughs> that's, that's a pretty good use of that. I'll just no critic that. It actually makes sense. It was some syntactic sugar thing that was tiny little thing, and it was in our tests. It's not shipped. <laughs> so I was okay with that one. You can also put stuff like this in your uh, books for your version control system. Too. Yes. Yeah, right. And, and depending on how you're doing version control and how you're, how you're uploading things, and, and there there's some interaction between that and your policy, your behavior of your developers and your release team and how they, how they interact with the version control system that may determine whether you use a hook or you use, when I run this, I'm going to run ProCritic. We have at cPanel a script called cplint that runs ProCritic. It runs Perl tidy. Um, it looks for new locale strings. It looks for, um, if you touch any file, all the tests that touch that file get rerun. Um, if you touch a test, it gets rerun. And all the other tests that touch the files it touches get rerun. Um, so it takes care of kind of some, some things for you. And, and it's funny how CPLint and, and ProCritic get the same kind of flame wars sometimes. It's really fascinating. But it's, it's a useful tool for finding bugaboos in the code before the release team does and sneers at you for them. Edwin. I think so. I think so. Yep, I think so. Um, I think there's a couple of rules related to comment behavior. And one of them, you could certainly write one because you can define when you're doing your PPI. You can say, I'm looking at words, I'm looking at lines, I'm looking at subroutines, I'm looking at, so you can kind of figure out what you're looking at. So you could look for lines and then, you know, tokenize the lines and figure out, you know, is there a comment here? Then you can look at the comment and say, well, does it have this thing in there that I want to scream about? So you could look for misuses of there, there, and there. <laughs> you, your, and your. Right? You, you could actually be a grammar Nazi that way if you wanted to. I, it's and it's. Mm hmm. It's and it's. Julian, you had your hand up? Um, this is more of a complaint than a question. But 44, we got one of the six minutes left. I run into is, you know, it'll say, you know, line so and so of Conway's book, and I've got it on Kindle on my phone, and I can't go to that page. That is one weakness of the system, yeah. Yeah, uh, that, that is one bugaboo of Pearl Critic is it lists page numbers in this book, um, which if you have the PDF is fine because um, the page numbers are mostly correct in that. Um, but, or if you have this, this book, um, you know, God help us if a second edition ever comes out. <laughs> you know, then Pearl Critic will be wrong. Uh, <laughs> And we'll have, we'll have to start all over and, okay, ProCritic dash dash theme equals first edition. <laughs> right? PBP1 and PBP2. 
Because you can disable all of the PVP rules by saying theme no PVP. So all of the PVP specific ones are in a theme together. Yeah, you know, I, I, the first time I saw it referring to a page number, I went, boy, that's silly. Having been in library business, I know about, you know, additions, <laughs> multiple printings, and page numbers don't always come out, even in same multiple printings of the same edition. So you're, depending on the page numbers, kind of, uh, it's a little shady. All right, we got time for about one more. Anybody else? Good luck. <laughs> God love you for no one else does. Well, right, and, and that's what our CP Lint script does, is it, it looks at the commit and says only the files that changed are fed into Pearl Critic. Um, so you could pretty easily, you could do that through a hook in your version control without too much trouble. Um, Brian, I think I see your hand up. Right, if you're procriticing a whole bunch of files, a whole directory full of things, it's gonna use one theme for everything. But you could do, you know, hooks in your version control to say only the files that changed. Do we wanna check against this theme or that theme? Uh, you, could, you could do some things with that. Um, but you'd have to write some wrappers. Right, so if your code is getting worse, it'll tell you about it, yeah. Uh-huh, all right, we are out of time. I want to thank you all for being here. I realize this is kind of early in the morning and some of you are a little hungover. Um, tomorrow will be worse, I assure you. Um, I, I really appreciate all the input, all the discussion. I think we had some lively talk without a lot of rancor, and that means a lot to me as a speaker. So, thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the conference. We'll see you around.